Hi, I'm Mary Beth. And I'm Sarah. And we are back again to share the personal experiences about stigma with our guests. Hi, my name is Marie. I live in Clark County. The local NAMI affiliate is NAMI Northern Shenandoah Valley. I have had depression my entire life and my diagnoses are major depressive disorder and anxiety. I am now a NAMI in our own voice presenter and I work as a peer recovery specialist. Hi, I'm Linda and I'm with the NAMI Rappahannock in Fredericksburg, Virginia area. And I've been involved with NAMI for about 15 years, taking many classes or teaching classes. And my lived experience is having a child uh, that has a mental health condition. And we have been on a long and windy road together. Hi, my name is Ron and I'm Linda's husband. And as she mentioned, we live in the Fredericksburg, uh, NAMI Rappahannock area. Uh, so my perspective is coming from a family of someone with a mental illness, particularly the male view, the father view. Hello, my name is Elena. I am in Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm a part of the Coastal Affiliate. I was diagnosed at the age of 11, 12 with depression and anxiety. And my other diagnoses include PTSD and borderline personality disorder. And I'm happy to say that I am a NAMI interim voice presenter, as well as a co-facilitator for the People of Color Recovery Support Group. Hello, my name is Andalisa, and I am from Richmond, Virginia. I am affiliated with the NAMI um, Central Office um, um, group, and I am the parent of a now 20-year-old who has some mental health challenges, and I have been affiliated or um, peering with NAMI for the past seven to eight years. And I now serve on their Virginia Family Network Advisory Board. Hi, I'm Liz. Uh, I live in Providence Forge, Virginia, and I've been involved with NAMI for about 10 years now. Uh, I have OCD and was started developing that when I was in middle school. And I also have many friends and family members that have mental health conditions. So I have a lot of lived experience both as a caregiver and as uh, someone with a mental health condition. Uh, I've done a lot of volunteering with NAMI Northern Virginia and NAMI Virginia in a myriad of programs over the years. Okay, so episode two, we're gonna jump back into this amazing conversation. Um, Marie, I kind of wanna just start with you and ask you what fears or concerns did you, or I guess, do you have about disclosing you have a mental health condition to friends and family. You know, it's it's interesting because when I went through the partial hospitalization program and sort of started finally coming into recovery, I felt that it was imperative that I be an advocate and that I talk to everybody and anybody about mental health. One of the things that I thought was a, a deal breaker for going into the partial hospitalization program was, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to tell my family what I'm going through because I had to take medical leave from work. And, you know, about maybe 20 years ago, I was talking to my mom about a friend of mine who was going through a really hard time. And I said, yeah, he, you know, he's seeing a therapist and he's working on it. And my mom said, oh, he's seeing a therapist. It's that bad. And I said, do you think that's really bad having to see a therapist? And she said, well, that's really serious. And I said, well, mom, I see a therapist sometime. And it just showed me that there was still a lot of stigma around. And so that of course, um, reinforced my stigma that I had for myself. And so I wasn't very open about it. Um, and then, like I said, when I went to the partial hospitalization program, I had to, I just had to be frank about who I was. I couldn't pretend any, it, there was no more pretense, no more hiding mental health condition. Like it's all out there. If that's, if I'm going to be healthy, it's all out there. So, um, once I sort of got over that fear, um, having said that it's still not always comfortable and I certainly don't always get the responses that I would like, <laughs> but, um, I guess the fear is really just kind of being, shamed, being rejected, uh, having your own worst feelings about yourself reinforced by someone else. I think there's a, another kind of stigma that we ran up against a long time ago, and that is 
the professionals know everything, and the family members, they don't really know that much. About eight years ago, uh, we got involved and wanted to get educated, as Marie said, try to educate yourself as much as you can. So anybody listening to this that has a loved one with a mental health condition, I'd say we'd all tell them to get educated as much as you can. Ron, I think something you're something you're touching on is kind of taking an active role in your recovery and in the recovery of those around you. At, I come from a history of substance abuse. I'm thankfully in recovery for almost four years now. And I, there is a really, I think, a big difference when we talk about it in the recovery community between sobriety or abstinence and recovery, right? We can be what we call a white knuckle drunk who is just getting through the day, but night, might not be actively living in recovery. And so what I hear you saying, Ron, is families when faced with this issue really need to kind of lean in and take an active and participatory role. Even if that participation is just, I'm just going to be with you and sit with you and listen to you. So th- thank you for bringing that up, Ron. I think that's well, separate. you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's got to be that we're not going to judge you. We're here. We're your safe place. We're the place that you come back to, to know that we're like the anchor that you have to protect you. And if I could piggyback on that, our daughter was someone that, you know, I gave birth to. And I loved unconditionally. And no matter what she was going to go through in life, I knew I was going to be there for her. But I could see in her teenage years that something was definitely um, off. And I needed to get the help. I needed my parents to get on board with me. Ron's family, my family, and I talked about it, just continued to talk about it and tried to get um, as much education as I could without going on the internet. So anyway, I just feel that that was something that I had to do to help myself was I needed to talk about it to as many people that, that really were in my court. We did learn that sometimes when you bring it up to a sibling, she didn't get it. And uh, it's taken a while for her sister to get it. And uh, it's, it's happening slowly but surely. I, I, Ron, thank you and, and Linda for bringing up the other perspective of like, you know, family members like siblings um, and how everyone can we how everyone reacts differently and and there's no right or wrong but you know people will be at different different places uh throughout the disclosure like me personally in my my experience you know even with medical professionals in the family it was surprising the stigma that comes out of medical professionals <laughs> related to and the medical professionals that are in the field of mental health and so for me it's like that what you guys are talking about like it, it's it's an ongoing conversation in a way. It's not going to change overnight in my mind. Um, sometimes it just has to be something that is talked about and made in a way like, let's just talk about it. Like, let's continue to talk about it and where, how you feel. So thank you for bringing that up. I was going to um, kind of parallel with what Marie was saying. So it's so interesting, this conversation about disclosure. It's something that seems to always come up in group. Um, and I... I guess since dealing like the first symptoms of depression and anxiety, I've always had a sense of low self-esteem and low self-worth. And I've t- a lot of it has had to do with shame and disgust of, you know, having mental health issues. And so I look at it now and I joke and my therapist used to laugh, but I used to call myself like a damaged box of cereal. And I always have this image, like, you know, you go to the cereal aisle and there's like, this discounted clearance box is all jacked up. However, like the inside is still good. The cereal is still good on the inside. It's just kind of jacked up on the outside. And so, you know, I always carry this like heavy burden and shame associated with my mental illness. And I remember one of the very first times that I was going to do an interim voice presentation, I was dating this gentleman 
And of course I was super nervous about doing the interim voice because I hadn't really done it before, but I was also excited because I'm like, this is my first time. I'm going to be telling my story, speaking my truth. And he and I had been dating like a month, month and a half or two months. And he was like, you have PTSD. And I was like, yeah. And so he called me like a day or two later and he was like, I can't date somebody who has, you know, depression, anxiety, da, da, da. And this is probably a couple of years ago and I definitely wasn't where I am now. Um, and it was just devastating um, because it seemed to validate the whole idea that I am a damaged box of cereal. Like I should feel ashamed of all of the things I'm dealing with. And the timing was awful because, you know, I'm about to go out and speak my truth and hopefully bring other people some, you know, hope and here, this guy just like shot a dart in my heart. Um, and so, you know, I've learned like, how useful is this information to the person? Like, what kind of relationship do I want to have with this individual? And so I'm still honestly learning, like, when is it safe? When is it appropriate? Um, I don't necessarily need to let them into my bubble or like my core entirely. And so that's kind of where I at, I'm at with the self-disclosure piece of it. I think, uh, Elena, I think you really uh, encapsulated a lot of what I experienced with self-disclosure where, you know, in a lot of ways, friends and family were never the uh, hard disclosures for me. Um, you know, in my, in my family of six, five of us have diagnosed uh, mental health conditions. And, you know, I had a lot of friends, like I, I was dealing with my friend's mental health conditions in high school before I ever realized that I had a mental health condition. Um, so they, they were, disclosing to them wasn't hard, but uh, disclosing to the rest of the world can be still really scary. Um, you know, particularly if it's a job, uh, I work at a, at a major mental health nonprofit, uh, shall we say. And uh, even when I disclosed there, like my heart was wrenching and I was really anxious and it was totally fine. It was totally fine, but it, it's hard. Um, I don't know. I think for me, a lot of it comes from um, having a mental health condition. There is this just really basic innate drive to like want to appear like I'm okay and I have it together. And I've gotten better about like living out loud and saying like, Hey guys, I'm not okay today. I'm taking a sick day because I need to go have a nap. But it's it's hard to step back from that and admit that you're not okay because you're working so hard to be okay or you know okay. I'm with you know air quotes around that. I, I remember an instance, particularly in college, when I when I got very sick and that's when I was diagnosed with OCD. Long story short, I ended up in the counselor's office and they're like you know, very kindly, they're like, you're not okay, you should go home and we'll postpone your exams. And then that was the correct answer. But I scared the heck out of all of my friends. Like, there were, like, my best friend knew. And that was it. And and so a lot of all my other friends at college and my professors who I was close to were really worried about me because they had no idea, like, anything had been wrong because I'd been putting on this happy face. And like, and so I think that can also that can also be be a challenge because sometimes when you do finally disclose, people are like, no, you don't, you're fine. And you're like, but you managed to do all these things. And you're like, I did manage to do all these things. I also got this other thing going on over here. So uh, those are some of the challenges that uh, you know I've experienced and I still face sometimes. And I think it's really sad that we have to still think about when do we disclose and when do we not. Um, for me, if I see, you know, an old high school friend, someone I haven't seen in several years or whatever, I usually it comes from, what are you doing now? <laughs> well, I work as a peer recovery specialist and, you know, and then it gets into a conversation about that. Um, you mentioned work, Liz. And when I got out of the partial hospitalization program, I felt so much stronger and I thought, oh, I'm going to be an advocate now. I'm going to talk to everybody about mental health. And I went in the first day back to talk to my boss. And as I started talking to her, my body started shaking uncontrollably. And I was shocked and disappointed because I thought, 
I'm telling her that I was at this program for depression and now she's looking at me and I am reinforcing every negative belief she has about people with mental illness. <laughs> so I've gotten better since then, but I, I do think it's sad that we kind of have to, you know, prospective employer, eh, maybe you don't want to disclose, you know, a prospective landlord, hmm, maybe you want to hold back on that, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, Liz, like, I totally get you. Um, I always mention, you know, the last section, like what's next in, in our own voice. It's, I'm always like, you know, I <laughs> bought into the Disney dream, American dream of, you know, BMW, nice house, 3.5 kids, a car, working full time, a career. And like, none of that has happened. Um, and I'm still happy. I'm still living a life that I want. And I think with dis disclosure, I think that I have had to accept, like, I can't work full time, like my body and my mind just won't allow me to. And so when it comes to employment and like, you know, people ask, what do you do? I always cringe because I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to tell them that I have depression. I have anxiety. And because of that, I can't work full time. Da, da, da. And so I have to like stop myself and be like, okay, they don't need to know all that information. And so it's this constant, like, I call it ping pong back and forth in my mind of like, do they need to know this? Why do they need to know this? And it's just a simple question that people are asking, like, what do you do? Um, and so it's, it's something that I definitely still struggle with and something that I try to be mindful of and remind myself, like, I don't have to tell everybody everything. Like, what do I want? Like, what kind of relationship do I want to have? this person or you know what is the goal of this whole conversation I have to remind myself of that and also not beat myself up because I am great at that um if I may talk too much say too much or I feel like I didn't say enough and so it's it's a little it's difficult and I actually remember I applied for a job years ago and I went to the interview and the job was full-time, but I figured I'm just going to apply part-time and see what they say. And she was like, oh, I see you want to work part-time, but we need you to full do full-time. Like, why can't you do it? And I remember telling her, oh, I have depression and I have insomnia and I'm tired all the time. And she was like, she kind of just gave me this blank stare on, you know, on her face. And I just kind of died inside because I basically invalidated myself. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's real. It's real. Yeah, I had to have this conversation with my son, like I said, now he's 20 and around employment because uh, the year before last, he went through like six jobs and a lot of it was because of his ADHD and, you know, him overlooking things or a supervisor telling him something and giving him too many steps and just all this stuff. And so um, we had to have this conversation because he never wanted, when we were filling out application, he never wanted to check the box about, do you have a disability and what kind it is? And he was like, no, no, no. Cause it's like, I don't need them to know. And after like the last time that he got let go, um, we really had to have this conversation about, you know, why it's important because this will protect you and it will give you, you know, those accommodations that you may need. And so he's been on his current job, maybe now, a year, which is like a miracle. He works in a processing plant. Um, I'm so I'm so proud of him. But he is like Speedy Gonzalez. He's all over that place. But you know, disclosing on the application that. But he had to at least let his immediate supervisor know. So if they're seeing him and he's here and he's there and you know he's doing a good job, but he's fast. He's like outworking the old people, <laughs> and they're like telling him slow down, slow down. But you know he he loves his job. He loves because he likes to stay busy. And he sees the benefit now that so if something did come up about, I think an issue did come up about one supervisor said, well, he's always in a hurry and he's always, you know, all over the place, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, that's kind of part of what happens with him, um, that he doesn't have to have that worry about because of this, you're going to let me go, you know. And it doesn't, it's not like he needs lots of accommodations, but just, you know, if you pace it right, he's good. I mean, like I said, I'm so proud of him. He's been there a year and he saw the benefit now of disclosing that on an application and just letting his immediate supervisor know what's going on with him. Not everybody in the plant knows, but that immediate supervisor who has to supervise him knows. So they'll be like, okay, I need you to go do this. And, you know, they know him. And so if they tell him to get something done, he gets it done, you know. So, but we had to have that long conversation about it because he didn't want anybody to think he was different or that something was wrong with him. And 
he wanted to be like everybody else. And he thought this would kind of like put a target on his back, make him say, hey, look at that guy, you know. And when he learned that it could be done discreetly in a way that would help him, then he was okay with it. But we went through like, I did his taxes one year and we had like six W-2s. And I was like, my God, you know, we went through a lot of jobs. And so, um, but now he's, he's got it and, you know, he accepts it. He knows it. You know, he'll tell you in a minute, you know, he's that kid that will never, even now, will never sit down. You know, he's always on the move. So he's talking to me, he's moving, he's talking to me, he's moving. And so for his employer to know that, then they're like, they're good with that. And so, um, like I said, I'm so proud of him and how far he's come and understanding his diagnosis and what that means and what he needs um, and can advocate for herself. I mean, so much so that they asked him to be like one of the trained to be one of the shop stewards to help kind of advocate for other people. So I'm really excited about that for him. We, you touched upon what I, I kind of have a theory that everybody that has a mental illness has a, a gift, a gift that they're better at than most people are doing. And, and the challenge as a parent is to figure out what that gift was. Like your son is, He's fast. His mind is going. He has to be doing physical stuff, moving. He can't just sit there. That's not going to work for him. But that's something he's better at than most people. And our daughter was good at writing. Now, some of the writing she wrote was pretty depressing, but she could put in the words things at 15 years old that I, I was amazed at. And so I think it's important that we don't look at mental illness as just a, a, a negative thing that they're there are pluses to it that it's up to us to go find out what they are. I have to say like this, I'm hearing a theme um, emerging a lot with regards to disclosing and how stigma can be internalized. You know, when we did disclose, you know, if we had a negative response from somebody, that shame that comes with that and how that can potentially follow us. I know for me personally, I have a fight or flight reaction to disclosing. But I can tell you right now that mine is fight. But that took many years. Like I, originally, I, I didn't get to that. It was more so the the flight reaction of not wanting to to state what I was feeling. But I think that that's just um, I'm kind of like the theme I'm hearing as well. Well, I can tell you, like when our daughter tried to commit suicide, I called my best friend and told him that she was going to commit suicide, and it was like, oh, well, she'll be fine. She'll snap out of it. I don't think people just know what to say, you know, instead of saying, I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. Uh, people feel, I, I kind of have compassion because people feel awkward of not knowing what to say. And for him, I kind of shut down for him for a while. I, I certainly didn't want to talk about mental health. He got it when his son started going through some issues with mental health. So, and I must say, for all of us here, when we really got involved, when we're personally impacted by it. Shameless plug for NAMI programs. But like, I think that's one of the, the, it's one of the reasons I've been involved with them. And then one of the reasons I think that they're really important because it's, it, things are shifting. You know, I'm seeing a lot more things in school for, you know, staff and, and parents and, and young adults and starting these conversations early but it's hard to know what you've never been taught. Um, and I remember when I finished Family to Family, one of our teachers was like, you should become a leader, a program leader, you should do this. And I remember thinking, this is great. Everything that I've been through and I've learned the hard way, now I can make it easier for, for somebody else coming up behind me. So I think Ron, what you said is exactly right is, you know, you know, a, a lot of people still just have no experience with it, um, which is uh, particularly when you've been involved with NAMI for a while, it, like, it's easy to forget that because everybody I know, like, I'm like, it's it's stranger to me now when somebody like, I, I don't have a mental health condition. I'm like, you don't? Like, which one do you have? <laughs> you know? Then if you can, you know, translating your experience to what you've been through to advocating for others is wonderful. But it's it's also one where I've been thinking is if we've been sharing it, like it sounds that all of us are in a, a place of recovery or a place of recovery with our, our loved ones or our children. Um, and that it's okay not to be at that place. It's okay to not want to go out and have to advocate for yourself every day too, because there are definitely points where, you know, it's like 
and you know, I still have days where like living, just getting through my life is what I can do. Uh, and so there, there's a balance in there. I do think nowadays people are also just really open to, to being educated or, or, or learning about something that they did not previously know about. You know, there's, you know, asking more questions or, or what Ra mentioned, I think in the first episode, um, listening, like learning to listen and not respond right away. Um, which makes it in, for me personally easier to, to disclose when I, when I feel ready to, but like to know that um, if someone is at that point where they would listen, even if they, you know, don't quite understand um, that that's okay too. We, I heard a couple of people mention kind of, um, kind of coping skills for what happens when you are deciding to disclose or when you do disclose and it doesn't go well. Elena, you were talking about how it's been a journey of, you know, trying not to beat yourself up about it. And, you know, I know I have, I have my little things that I do at the beginning of the day that I sort of fortify myself with so that I can go into the day and feel protected and like I'm coming from a place of authenticity, but I was just curious if anybody has any particular things that they do that, you know, can, that you feel like have been really helpful when a disclosure doesn't go well to kind of help bring yourself back into that centered point. No pressure if anyone doesn't, but I'd just be curious. For me, Sarah, one of the things that I think help most helpful there is having a really strong support network. Um, and that, that can look like a lot of things to a lot of people. It, it can be family, it can be friends, it can be chosen family. You know, I, I mentioned her earlier, but my best friend from college also has a mental health condition. And it's so nice because I can text her and like, I said this and this person said this and she will immediately be like, well, that was terrible. And you're like, right? And that can be our whole conversation, but just knowing I have somebody to check in with, I think that's really important for me uh, because you know, when, when somebody kind of takes you down a peg, it's, it's nice to go back and be like, I wasn't wrong, right? And then when I'm like, you're fine. You're like, okay, see, I'm fine, I'm fine. Everybody says I'm fine. I, it's so true. Like with the guy, I remember it was just like, my brother's awesome. I was crying and like, I had my phone in front of me and all of a sudden I get this ding. It's like, hey, Layda, and I'm like, oh, Alvin, da, 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 happened. And my brother's just like, he's such a jerk. You deserve so much better. And yeah, it's just like getting that validation that, okay. And then too, it's, I have to keep reminding myself like all the time that like, I am not my diagnosis. Like I am a whole other person. Like Elena, you like plants. Like Mary Beth knows my little odd plant uh, hobby that I have where I try to like bring dead plants back to life. Like you like to do martial arts. So I have to constantly remind myself that I'm not depression. I'm not anxiety. Like there are things that make Elena, Elena. And it, you know, I don't, you know, I'm a whole other, I'm a person. That is so true, Elena. Um, that goes back to kind of like what Ron was saying about um, gifts. You're not your diagnosis. You have so many other gifts and I have to, you know, encourage my son about that. I mean, he's athletic. He's, you know, he's sharp. He's fast. He's, he's so many other things than just his diagnosis. And so whenever he does have a bad day, something's going on, I, you know, I remind him all the other things that he's so good at, you know, so I'm kind of like that cheerleader all the time, just helping him to know because he's still growing and that mind is still developing <laughs> um, that, you know, you're way more than that. You know, you have so much more to offer. You know, you can do so many different things, you know, you know, you could travel. I mean, at this point, you're a young man with a job and money and you don't really have any bills or responsibility. You can go travel the world if you want it to, you know, just to really pour into him that he's not just stuck with whatever maybe someone said about him. This is why I think language is so important. Um, talk about bipolar disorder. I think. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say she has bipolar, he has bipolar disorder. It's always, she's bipolar, he's bipolar. And it's a subtle difference, but I think it really matters. And so I think the language that we use is so important. Um, and like we talked about in the last episode, things like, oh, I'm OCD. I have to have this, you know, that just trivializes it or mischaracterizes it. Um, I, I think that we, if we make a conscious effort to do that, I think there's, again, 
a, a long way to go, but I think each of us can just chip away a little bit at a time and, and make our mark. And then hopefully it spreads out and, and spreads awareness, uh, you know, on a wider level. It's Marie, we've, we've brought this up a couple of times now, you know, the difference between the way mental health is treated and the way physical health is treated. You, you know, you would never hear someone say, oh, she's cancerous unless they were really like not being a very nice person. You know, you, they would say she has cancer. You would never treat someone or introduce someone or talk about someone the way that we sometimes do about people with mental health conditions. It's interesting too, the like inanimate objects or just like things like the weather. Oh, the weather is, is so bipolar, you know, and it, it's just using it in all of the contexts, you know, outside of just people. Um, and with the language, has anybody, um, does anybody have any experience with just mentioning that to somebody or hearing, overhearing it and like what language it was and how it was, how you responded to it? And well, I think what Marie was saying is, is on point. The language we use is like, and, and what Sarah was saying, you don't say somebody, he, he's a heart attack or, or cancer or something like that, and try to explain that to people that, you know, it's the brain, the physical thing that affects mental health. Uh, one of the things I think people get is like our grandson has uh, type 1 diabetes. Now, when his blood sugar is low, guess what? Watch his behavior. He's going to, his behavior is totally going to change get grumpy, whatever, they kind of get that. That's kind of a little step stone to, to understanding mental health. But what we say and the words we choose make a difference. And like Maria was saying, you chip away at it. And if I could just add, as a caregiver, if I'm having a moment with our daughter or something, and I need to step back. I really know how to do that now. I can step back and I can breathe. I have found as a caregiver, I really need to do yoga exercises. It has really helped me. And if I'm my healthy self, then I can better help her. Well, the other thing, I'll piggyback on Linda saying, being the only guy in, in the family of daughters, even the dog, the female dog. What what I've learned also sometimes it's like when there's a negative situation, I don't have to confront it right now. I can let it go instead of I have to do something about it. I remember one time our daughter uh, came unglued about something. I realized there's no logical way to talk to her. So I said, well, I'll just wait till tomorrow. And the next morning I said, you know, Lauren, you could have handled it like this last night in a, in a very calm way and she said you know you're right or sometimes she might bring it up to me and say hey i apologize i could have done this so one of the things as far as communication is you don't always have to take action right then sometimes just sit on it for a day or so um kind of going back to what you said marie and um thinking about you know how do how do you address it when somebody uses language is that stigmatizing is I tend to be rather conflict averse in my life. It is a skill I am working on and I, I'm getting better at, but boy, if I can avoid a conflict, I will. And so, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to say somebody, you know, who's a close family friend, like, hey, the thing you're like, you're saying is really not okay. You know, I find it challenging to call somebody out like that. And so I will often, find a middle ground, which, you know, maybe not the best thing, but I will offer differences or, or try and do it in a less confrontational way. So like, if they're like, the weather's so bipolar, I might say variable is a much better word to use for that, you know, and it's, it's not as clear or as explicit of saying, that's not a great word for these reasons. Here's why I would say that, but it still lets me get some of that communication across of this is this, or I, I might phrase that differently because things become so ingrained in language. You don't even realize that you're saying something that uh, is stigmatizing or, or really offensive until somebody stops and is like, maybe use this word instead. And 
I was going to say, it's so funny that you guys brought up the bipolar, uh, the weather, because I hear that a lot. And my approach to it, Liz, I am pretty conflict averse as well. Like I'm getting better at progress, right? Um, I ask questions. I'm like, so what, what are you saying? Because that way they can kind of hopefully catch themselves and realize that what they're saying isn't maybe necessarily what they meant or what they're saying is completely inappropriate. And I've noticed that that kind of does happen. And so I don't feel as, I feel more of like um, investigator and less like instigator, but it's like, hopefully they can catch, you know, their error there. So, yeah. And also Another. language changes too. You know, there's things that, that what, what used to be acceptable ways to, to state things that no longer now as we as we learn more and educate ourselves now we, we no longer use those those words or use that phrasing i mean for the longest time it was mentally ill and and now we're moving you know move towards the people first language or people centered even with like social workers who are older than than me who have been doing it for a while are, are still using outdated language you know another good tool that we actually talk about in family and friends is using i statements in other words, if I say, okay, Elena, when you say this, you're wrong about mental illness, and I get really angry. Instead of that, I say, when you talk about this, this is how I feel. Now, I'm not, you're not going to be as defensive if I talk about this is how I feel, or this is how I perceive what you're saying, checking it out. Uh, because, again, if you use I statements and stay away from you statements, it's a pretty powerful way to communicate. I was just going to add on the subject of language, uh, I guess this whole conversation has made me think about the language I use with myself, because like Marie, I mean, when I was hospitalized for the last time, like six years ago, I was in a space where probably a year or two where I just, I needed to survive. Um, because I had attempted suicide. And so my sole purpose was learning how to take care of Elena and doing the work. And a big part of that was shifting how I talked about myself. And I think I mentioned before, like having self-compassion and definitely something that I'm working on and not beating myself up. And so I just want to mention like, yes, definitely communication and language when talking to other people or family is super important. But I feel like it starts with in yourself, it started with in myself so that I could realize like, I need to be gentle with myself or else, you know, you kind of get that energy back when, you know, you're talking to others or advocating, so. I think too, things are, things are growing and shifting in ways that I feel like, A, we haven't accounted for and B, can sometimes be even challenging for us within the field or even as peers or as people with lived experience to hear. And I, you know, I think something that's been so important for me on this journey is to know, you know, what's, what's true for me might not be true for you. Where I stand and where I come from is from a different experience and a different vantage and viewpoint than where you come from. But I know speaking for myself from the substance abuse recovery side, which I, I do think is so intertwined and it's amazing to see the overlap between that and mental health recovery is, you know, just speaking from a younger generation, I have sometimes felt like the outlier in the room because I try and push maybe, you know, a more progressive or out there <laughs> way of talking about things. I really want to try to move the needle forward. And I think part of that has been accepting that I might make other people a little uncomfortable, but accepting that that discomfort is the only way that we are going to transform and create something new, you know? So even when I'm having conversations with my psychiatrist, my therapist, People in the professional realm, people in my family, it's how do I find areas where I can speak my truth, live authentically and speak authentically and help help us take a step forward collectively, right? Because it's, it's these actions, these small actions of the individual that are going to help us get there and change it. 
So just my just my two cents on some themes that I'm hearing here of like the self advocacy of just being willing to be yourself and say what needs to be said in the moment and stand in your truth is I think really powerful. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, Ron mentioned in the last episode, I think about uh, cancer, how you didn't need to talk about cancer. I remember in my lifetime, when I was a kid, people never wanted to disclose that they had epilepsy. It had a lot of stigma around it. And I, that's in my lifetime, I've seen that change. And so I, I think we're getting there with mental health conditions. Will it happen in my lifetime that everybody just feels completely open and comfortable talking about it? Mm, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I sure hope so, you know, but I do think that we'll get there. I think we're getting there. It's just the change never happens as quickly as we want it to. But again, I think we are all agents of change and talking about it openly, even though it's uncomfortable sometimes, even though some people might side eye us when we do, we, like you said, we got to live our truth. We have to keep advocating. We, Marie, uh, Mary Beth just sent me a note that was like, Marie gives great bookends to things because I feel like that is such a lovely way to kind of wrap up this portion of things. Mary Beth, I don't know how you feel, but this has been such an just enlightening and incredible conversation to just witness. And I really can't wait for everyone at home to hear all of this stuff. I think what you all are doing is exactly what we're talking about is standing in our truths and advocating and creating kind of a new safe space and a new way for us to reach people to try and move this needle forward. So Mary Beth, anything else you want to add on to the end of this or any final thoughts from anybody before we sign off? I'm always just so humbled by um, the, the, the conversations and people's experiences. And, um, and I just, as Sarah said, standing in your truth, I think that's a really powerful statement. And so I just want to thank you guys for, for joining us and doing this. NAMI Virginia is a nonprofit organization that offers free support, education, advocacy for families and individuals impacted by mental illness. This audio event was made possible due to the generous support of our funders and individual donors like you. If you're interested in supporting our work, please visit our website at www.namivirginia.org slash donate.